Yo, what is up everyone? yoda 2003 here. I hope I'm not the only one that feels this way when I say I'm all but enchanted by the video equipment of yesteryear. Starting in the 1950s and proceeding into the next half century, it was a magical time for the development and usage of electronic video. Driven by the promise of a filmless future, the technology evolved until it, quite tragically, stagnated and fell into obscurity, replaced by its digital cousin. Now all that's left of what is now deemed analog video are artifacts from a time long gone, left in the dust by a computer revolution. You know what's great about these artifacts though? They still work! Here, all I have to do is connect this here. Here, let me, let me do that. And plug this into here. Alright, that should be good enough. Now all I have to do is turn on this TV here. Why isn't this working? It was working just fine when I plugged it into the VCR, and the VCR has the same connector as the back of this TV. What could have possibly gone wrong here? A quick look at the oscilloscope can clear all of this up. I will show you a Super Nintendo Fox, I mean Super Nintendo Entertainment System that has a classic yellow, red, and white connectors, and a VCR that has a pointy, screwy connector. Now, I hope those are technical terms, technically, Ian. Well, if you really want to be precise, the yellow, red, and white connectors are called RCA connectors, named after the company that popularized their usage. The pointy, screwy connector is usually referred to as an RF connector, or coaxial. Or just coax for short. <laughs> oh yeah, totally. What's the difference exactly? Here, it's better if I show you. This is what Super Mario looks like starting up on the Super Nintendo. Look at that. Pretty neat, huh? Huh. Why did it change like that as the picture got brighter? That's so cool. All in due time, my friend. Now let's see the same signal output through our VCR as a middle step. Look at that. What? That's entirely different from before, and it looks so much more overwhelming. How could I possibly understand this? We'll get to that, Theatrical Ian. Technical Ian, I can take it from here. Sounds good, Teacher Ian! Technical Ian is really smart, but he struggles to dumb things down for people. Let me ask you a question, Theatrical Ian. Oh man, I hate being called on. Have you ever considered what Technical Ian was measuring just now? You know, now that you mention it, I really don't know. It just looked like one of those graphs from science and math class. The ones with the two variables. Precisely. What might those two variables be? Well, I do know that video takes time to play back, and time is usually the variable on those, so it must be time. Right again. Any guesses on that second variable? Uh, uh, hmm. Let's start with the basics. To help us drill down to that, I'll tell you right away that the second variable we were talking about is electric potential, also known as voltage. There's plenty of videos here on YouTube that talk about what electric energy, current, and voltage are, and how they work, but just know that you can think of voltage as the average amount of potential energy per electron that a given electric current has. Imagine a loop of plumbing pipes filled with water. The voltage in an electric circuit is analogous to the pressure produced by a pump connected to the water loop. The more pressure there is, the more work you can do with that water, because it has more kinetic energy. By analogy, the more voltage there is in a circuit, the more work you can do through the electric field. And no, the electrons do not move along the length of the cable. The energy does. With all of this in mind, as far as your Super Nintendo, CRT television, and VCR are concerned, this voltage is just a number that changes over time. It's how exactly these changes occur that distinguishes what engineers call a signal from the electricity we use every day to power our homes and cities. Pretty much all electrical signals operate over direct current, or DC for short. AC, or alternating current, is the counterpart and is great for moving lots of energy down long distances. However, it's less useful for doing what the Super Nintendo wants to do, which is getting information from one end of the cable to the other. That's all well and good, Teacher Ian, but how exactly do we translate between a two-dimensional moving picture with three different color channels into a one-dimensional voltage that changes over time? Surely there's no way to pack all that information in there. Well, Theatrical Ian, there's many different ways we can encode a given piece of information into the medium of electricity. Let's start with a simpler example. 
Consider what this microphone does. It turns sound into electricity. How exactly? Let's review what sound is. Sound is a mechanical pressure wave that propagates through a solid, liquid, or gaseous medium. Don't interrupt me while I'm teaching, Ian. <laughs> but he was completely correct in his short outburst. In normal speak, he meant to say that sound is a wave of kinetic energy that moves through the air by squishing the air in some places and stretching it in others. Exactly how fast the squishing and stretching occurs determines the pitch of the sound and exactly how much the air is being squished and stretched determines how loud the sound is. How does this relate to the microphone, though? Well, if you zoom into a sound wave, the volume, or air pressure, changes super quickly over time to generate sounds. The microphone detects these extremely fast changes in air pressure and converts their kinetic energy into electrical energy. What did we learn earlier about voltages and pressure? Oh, I got you now. So you must mean that the highs and lows of the pressure wave are being converted to similarly high and low voltages in the cable. Precisely. Great job, Theatrical Ian. Oh, so he gets a pat on the back for giving the answer, but I get yelled at? You're the worst teacher ever! Now, now, Technical Ian. Uh, let's not get all up in arms. I'm sorry I yelled at you. I shouldn't have lost my temper. <sighs> Antics aside, Video signals are treated in a very similar way to audio signals. If you consider a black and white image and imagine unwrapping it into tiny vertical rows of information, we could pretend that, at any given moment, a high voltage in the signal represents a bright picture and a low voltage represents a dark picture. Huh, that's actually really clever. But what about color though? You need to have at least three different cables just for that. How come all that information can go over just one? Obviously, the teacher is going to talk about modulation next. Yet again, he's right. It's time to talk about modulation. To understand the composition of TV video signals, there's three different kinds of modulation you need to understand the basics of. First on that list is, of course, the simplest, amplitude modulation. You see, back in my days, Johnny, they had only AM radio. And the thing about the AM radio is that it wasn't very high quality. It wasn't as high quality as the new FM radio that you kids use. And you see, we would listen to baseball games during that time. I remember those memories. But the only thing that could bring those baseball games from a hundred miles away to my home living room was by giving those signals more power! Oh yes, too old Ian is right. But the interesting thing is, there's technically speaking two different ways to do that with waves of all kinds. Electromagnetic, sound, what's the difference? One is by increasing the amplitude, and the other is by increasing the frequency. Spot on, technical Ian. But you're missing something very crucial in your explanation. What? Impossible! My explanation was as flawless as my internet! You forgot to define what power really means, like physically. You see, power has a very simple definition in physics. You can think about it as how fast energy is changing over time. Literally, the definition of a watt is in units of joules per second. So naturally, what technically Ian is saying makes perfect sense. The faster an electromagnetic wave oscillates, the faster the energy it carries changes over time. Likewise, the more energy the wave carries, the more effort it must necessarily take to go from a low peak to a high peak in a given amount of time. Well, <laughs> I already knew that, you see, but insightful nonetheless, ticker Ian. Anyways. Going back to what too old Ian was saying, to help the sounds of a baseball game travel hundreds of miles, that signal needs to have a lot of power. You can only make radio waves so energetic before it doesn't make much sense to pump that power any higher. So the solution that engineers came up with was simple, a way to increase the frequency of a signal while still carrying the same information. Let's move over to Editor Ian to help explain the concept with some interactive graphs. Thanks, Teacher Ian. Alright, so right here I have a graphical demonstration of amplitude modulation. So in purple here, we have our signal, which I can adjust the frequency of. And the idea here is that we want to get the message across a long distance, right? Like too old Ian was saying. 
So how we can do that is by essentially modulating this signal at a higher frequency. So if we enable the modulated signal here, we can increase or decrease the frequency accordingly. So as you can see, it kind of fills in the part of the graph below the signal. All the peaks touch the original signal like this. And at the low points, we have the modulated signal tending towards the origin, as you can see here. And at the high parts, that's when the amplitude is highest. So we use low amplitudes to represent the low signal bits and high amplitudes to represent the high signal bits. And one last thing before I bring things back to teacher Ian. Um, the thing about being able to modulate, modulate these signals at different frequencies is that say you have one signal being amplitude modulated at 15 megahertz and another at 20 megahertz and you have them combined both together. The thing about amplitude modulation is that there's ways of picking out the two separate signals because they're modulated at different frequencies from this mixed input. So that's really cool because it means that we can combine different signals together at different frequencies and recover the information separately. So yeah, back to you, teacher Ian. Thank you, editor Ian. So as you can see, amplitude modulation is a very useful tool for encoding and separating information in a way that helps it travel longer distances in a variety of frequencies. I don't see how this answers my question about how three different color signals go down one cable though. Am I missing something? Don't worry, theatrical Ian. I'm getting to that next. You see, this entire time we've been talking about frequencies and amplitudes, but there's one other crucial component to waves, and more specifically signals, that we've glossed over. Think about what happens when two waves are traveling side by side. Both waves have peaks and troughs. However, those peaks and troughs aren't always in sync. This difference between how far along one wave is relative to the other is called its phase. The most out of sync that two waves can be is by the length of one of its humps. In other words, waves that cancel each other out are the most out of sync they can possibly be. Any other phase between them will produce less destructive interference, until they perfectly add to each other. So this makes phase an intrinsically cyclical concept. Now, imagine two waves that are a quarter wavelength out of phase. Let's use them to amplitude modulate two different signals. The combination looks like this. Interestingly enough, this now gives us one wave encoding two independently changing values. But the signals just were disfigured! How could you possibly recover any information from this? I still only see one amplitude, Mr. Teacher. Think about it, technically, Ian. You're right. The amplitude of the wave is just one dimension of the signal's information. But there's another one. Keep in mind, this is a combination of those two waves. The second dimension is expressed through the changing phase between it and a reference signal. What? That's crazy! My mind totally equals bro right now. <coughs> oh, kids moment. Anyway. It is pretty crazy. It's useful enough, too, that engineers gave it its own name. Quadrature Amplitude Modulation, or QAM for short. For the research savvy out there, keep in mind that this is analog QAM. Digital QAM is a similar concept in that it's used for multiplexing signals efficiently. However, it is very different in its principles and goals. So, I'm confused now. Where does that leave us with the video signals? That's two channels, but we still need a third one, right? This is where that signal separation that both AM and QAM provide comes in. As long as we use the right frequencies, we can easily make three signals into one. Here's how the engineers of the American NTSC TV standard did it. They encoded the black and white signal exactly how I described earlier. But on top of that, they invented a color system which is composed of two main channels. One is luminance, denoted as the letter Y. The other is chrominance, denoted as C. Hidden inside of C is I and Q. Those stand for the two out-of-phase waves I described earlier when talking about QAM. What's clever is that the way this color system works, when I and Q are combined, 
the relative phase in the modulated signal is roughly equivalent to the hue of the color, and the amplitude is roughly equivalent to the saturation, or how rich the color is. I think I get it! So, then both the Y and C signals are added together, I assume at least, Be but because C is modulated at different, more specific frequency than Y, it makes it easier to recover both signals separately! Genius! Genius indeed, technical Ian. So that answers one of my questions. Now we know exactly what's going on in this yellow cable here. But what about the other connector? How can it carry both audio and video? And at that rate, how can it carry all of the available TV channels at once? Ah uh, yes. Well that's very easy to explain now that I've gotten all that other stuff out of the way. You see, all of the different TV stations broadcast that same composite video signal inside of the yellow cable. Only, it's amplitude modulated at a frequency given to them by the local government there. That's how your antenna, and subsequently your TV, can pick out between all the different TV channels, all going through one cable. That still doesn't answer the audio question though. How does that work? You're exactly right. The audio signal is added after the fact to the AM video signal, just using a different technique called FM, or frequency modulation. Fair enough. It all makes sense to me now. So what the VCR at the start of the video is doing that my adapter here at the back of the TV isn't, is all of that modulation stuff. Thanks, Teacher Ian. No problem, Theatrical Ian. And thank you all for watching this video. See you guys next time.